read your book. Oh, I've come up with some lovely questions, all of which are nice. Um, <laughs> I've behaved. And um, I wanted to, obviously, I don't know how much you guys know, um, the book Children's Fantasy Literature, and it sort of runs through um, kind of the history of how Children's Fantasy came about and um, how it sort of moved through time um, to what it's become today and how it's exploded out kind of in the last maybe 20, 30 years into just kind of massive, fantastic things. Um, so I kind of gauged some questions which just hopefully will make Farah tell you loads about the book and how good it is and how interesting it is. Um, so, okay. Um, so firstly, I want to ask, how did the book and sort of the ideas and themes within it come about between you and Michael Levy? Okay, so I've known Mike a very long time now, about 20 years. I met him at the International Association of the Fantastic in the Arts, and both Mike and I have that thing where we tend to recruit people. And as somebody else once said to me, the worst thing is we recruit people for jobs they actively wanted to do. Mike had started the Children's Literature Division at the IFA, but it's one of those areas where, it, particularly in the United States, there's an age gap. But um, this is one of those technical things that's worth knowing if you want a career. There was a hiring freeze in the 70s. Now, what that meant was that I am the oldest of my generation in science fiction. Okay? <laughs> Above me is a 15-year age gap. All right? Uh, behind me, there's uh, several people like, within a year or two of me. But I am literally at that front of the curve. There's this gap. And although it's not quite as extreme in children's literature in the States, it actually is in, here, in, in the UK in children's literature. So people are starting to retire here. And again, I'm kind of the next age group down. And there aren't that many of us. And then there's a flood. Right? So when Mike was looking for somebody to take over the division, he didn't have a lot of choice. And I was not flagged as a children's literature person at that point. Uh, but what happened at that con conference is that they lost somebody off a panel. And it was quite a, a big name panel with people like Jack Zipes on it. And Mike, who'd been chatting with me off and on, um, asked me to be on it. Now, I was very sick as a kid. I started fainting when I was about eight. Started the migraine when I was 11. By the time I was 14, I was spending about a third of my time at home. I was not getting to school much. So it was at this conference that we discovered just how useful all the reading I'd done was. I was really sick in bed. Uh, and, and this is going to sound egotistical, and it's not meant to be. But by the end of the panel, it was clear that I had read more children's fantasy than everybody else on the panel and in the audience combined, which was news to me. I, I've spent years saying, sorry, not really a children's literature expert. So Mike then introduced me to Jack Zipes properly. I got the contract from Downer and Jones. I, he then commissioned me to write an article on science fiction which later turned into the Intergalactic Playground. And so at the same time as things like Redrix of Fantasy was taking off, there was this other thing happening. And then my partner and I wrote a short history of fantasy, which is a book I was supposed to write on my own, but I'm actually not very good at narrative history, and he is. Uh, I'm much more analytical, thematic, why is this wrong driven? And whilst I was doing that, Mike said, Oh, and by that point, the Children's Literature Division was going. I'd been the second person. We'd both been v vice president of the organization in turn. He'd been president, then I'd been president. We worked together a lot. And it's relevant to this because what we'd been doing at, in order to, the IFA was set up by some very close friends who ran it for 25 years until they were sick of each other <laughs> and could not let go. And, People laugh, but this is a very toxic situation and it happens to a lot of organizations. And it's Mike and I who kind of change that with a, a colleague. And the experience of doing that, where you've got these people who are miserable, but won't let go, really kind of turned us into a team. You find it everywhere, okay? People get very fond of things. If ever you're engaged in running something and you stand down, my advice is take a month off, at least six months. Walk away. Because if you don't, it's hard to let go. And it's bad for you, it's bad for the organization. But it really bound us together. And Mike started saying, you know, we should write a book. No, we should work on a book together. And his proposal was that we would edit it, which is cool enough. Except that we came up with three proposals, all of which boiled down to, well, which chapters are we going to give to other people because we want to write them? And by the way, they are actually the leading people in this field. And, and it was one of those things, again, it's about that age gap, okay? 
it's not that we are the best people in the field, it's that in that moment and that space, most of the people we might have asked were considerably younger and less experienced. So that's okay, but it would have been a very specific thing which we'd have had to guide. So I basically bent Mike's arm, because he'd only written one book before. I said, Mike, we need to write this, and I think Cambridge will take it. And part of the reason we decided we needed to, to write it, apart from the difficulty of finding the right people, was we started to realize that there were things that were bothering us about what was out there. And although we were always clear we were doing English language, because we're both monoglots, I'm afraid, both of us felt that the story that was being told didn't take enough account of differences in different markets, didn't take any account of when, sorry for the term, but colonial markets mm -hmm. came on board, and really wasn't taking on board issues of diversity in any but tokenistic ways. And we really wanted to address that. We wanted a narrative that saw children's fantasy as part of the children's book industry. We wanted a narrative that gradually drew in new aspects of the industry as they emerged, and we wanted to be able to write a narrative. Okay, and I, I need to deviate slightly. One of the ways you cut out diverse voices is not, in fact, by concentrating on white authors. It's by pre-selecting topics. Um, there's a book I, I won't mention that got me particularly irate because it sets out being wanting to be terribly diverse in the introduction, and the only place it has for women and black people is under gender and race. <laughs> and this is a Marxist writing okay? and as I said in my um, review of this book there are topics this author could have picked that would have automatically brought in women uh, would have brought in people of other cultures uh, I'm just trying to think yeah, you start talking about ecology for example then suddenly you're talking about global issues so the, the choices you make direct that. And Mike and I were always very much on the same wavelength on that. I mean, yeah, we're both white. We're both, as it happens, Jewish. <laughs> I don't know what difference that makes, except that it made us probably more willing culturally to have ding-dong arguments that some people would be. Um, this is a, a culture that is totally cool with having a huge blow-up at dinner and getting on with it. So we, we had some quite specific things we wanted to achieve. And also, one of the things we wanted to showcase was the degree to which children's fantasy was often the site of innovation. So this is tricky to put your finger on because I couldn't quote you any particular person. But when you read histories of adult fantasy, apart from the nod to Tolkien and Lewis, they often skip out the children's fantasy writers. But if you're looking at the 19th century and the interwar period, a lot of the really exciting and experimental fiction is, the is written for children. Children's writers is a problematic term. And I wanted to get that over. I wanted, I think this is more me than Mike, I wanted to get over that sense of experimentalism and that this material is part of the main story of fantasy. And I think Edward and I had tried to do that in a short history of fantasy as well that we'd not tried to deal with children's fantasy as a separate chapter. We'd kind of tried to thread it in all the way through. Okay, long answer. So <laughs> I don't need any questions. No, it's okay. She did actually cover kind of two of my questions <laughs> in her answer, so that was kind of nice. You can elaborate things. Yeah, so, so that's kind of a start. Um, yeah, no, that's Mike good. spent the next five years swearing at me, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all that's, my fault. It's fine. Um, actually, then, my, my second question, which you did actually just touch on, was about what you went into the work to achieve. And do you, what, what, just, did you just go, it. Okay. what did you go into the work hoping to achieve? And do you yeah. feel that you came out of that achieving? Oh, yes and no. I, okay, one of the difficulties, problems, issues, we were commissioned to write this book to go into Cambridge's introduction to fact, introduction series, um, introductions to narrative, introduction to this, introduction to this. They have very set formats. We wrote the book for that. It would have been terribly helpful if at some point they'd told us they'd have taken it out. The first point at which we realized it was no longer going in the series was when we were on the second edit. Huh. Now, if it had, we'd known from the beginning it wasn't going in, 
we would have ditched an awful lot of the focus on individual authors, I think. Um, I think we'd have been more argumentative. Because it was going into this series, which had to be relatively dispassionate, neutral, etc., we peddled back on what I think was my trademark irritability. <laughs> <laughs> I'd actually, I'd agree with that, actually. Yeah. Having read all your other books. It, it's it, quite temperate by my standards, it, isn't it? <laughs> it, it? It definitely has a touch more of the short history about it. Yeah. Like, the sort of, it doesn't go into kind of arguing about themes no. and stuff. It goes, it, it's much, especially near the end, it definitely stays on like a level when you're just kind of explaining, you're just explaining, exactly. you're not... It's a much more explanatory yes, book. Yes, which is kind and of nice. And that's rooted in the origins of the contract. Yeah. And I, I still feel a bit peeved with Cambridge. They did a couple yeah. of things like that that really bothered me. And uh, I don't know if any of you are interested in publishing, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that can shape books that many people don't realise. Yeah. Um, I mean, it can be something as simple as rhetorics of fantasy, they wanted a subtitle. And I bished that by suggesting five essays. <laughs> I hate subtitles. Um, the title for the Diana Wynne Jones book is so bad, I cannot remember it. I have to look at it every damn time. I wanted the critical fictions of Diana Wynne Jones. Critical as in really important. Critical as in they are critical, they criticize things. Wasn't allowed it. Um, that's how I think of the book. It's the title of chapter one. Yeah, it would have been so much better at <laughs> so, But Ratledge isn't a commercial publisher, so they don't tend to think commercially, no. whereas I'm relentlessly commercial um, and have no shame about that. It's hence why A Short History of Fantasy. Oh, sorry, can I back up slightly? A Short History of Fantasy was a completely different book contract. I was asked to write a book that was basically about the origins of Harry Potter, okay. and I couldn't do it because I couldn't find A Short History of Fantasy to guide some of the no. things I wanted to say. And I said, will you let me do this instead? And they said, no. <laughs> and I kept struggling. And I said, will you let me do it instead and write it with my husband? And they said, no. So we wrote it. And they accepted <laughs> it, which is possibly the definition of chutzpah. But we called it a short history of fantasy because that was what I was busy Googling, desperately trying to find. And I don't know about you, but the number of times I have not been able to find the obvious book because somebody had given it one of those horrible, incredibly poetic, charming <laughs> titles colon, something really boring that actually describes what the book does, it doesn't appear on the universe. Capital. Yes? Yep. So I am, I mean, I've been, I felt like this since I was an editor of articles. Just give the damn thing the title. <laughs> and one that makes sense, please. So, <laughs> relentlessly commercial. So yeah, I'm actually, I, there is a definitely a book, I won't name it, but I can think of that it's exactly that. It's actually a really good the book on fantasy, but Your it's... thesis title wouldn't get past me. No, it's actually <laughs> <different> now. <laughs> Frankly, it's a completely different title, if it helps. <laughs> Um, but they wanted they wanted something more. When I gave them the what it is now, they were like, mm, no, it's one that's of the not things that causes mockery outside the academy. Yes. Just name yep. the damn book. Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> we think so. It's very simple. Three words now. So you're okay. Oh, it's the fantasy heritage. Perfect. 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 <laughs> Which explains my thesis a lot better. Yes. Um, uh, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> on that note. Um, what were the main discussion points between you and Michael and your disagreements, and did you make compromises between you? Okay, so some of them were very basic. We decided, part of, I missed this bit out, part of the reason we decided we could do this book, um, I'm hoping most of you know this, but you may not, some of the younger ones may not realise this, until about 1995, the British and Empire market, British and Commonwealth market, was almost completely separate from the United States market. There were points of leakage across the Canadian border. There were the odd exchanges. We have the Wizard of Oz, they get the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But there's nothing we win. <laughs> As a rule of thumb, I could have a conversation with somebody from Singapore or Delhi about children's literature. I could not have that conversation with an American, unless they were a specialist. We just would not be talking about the same books. And I'm an American historian, so I have a little bit of overlap, not much. So it was always an issue that we realized we could only do this if we had one person from either side of the market. And from the beginning, he got the USA and later Canada, and I got the empire. <laughs> <laughs> that was the easy one. Um, then we had to divide up periods as well. And some of that was influenced by the fact that I'm not very keen on quest fantasies. Now, I read them a lot when I was younger, 
and at some point I went off them. Your list of people is a list of people I don't read anymore. I know. Now, they're all very good. This isn't a criticism of their quality. But they, particularly when I was doing my tricks of fantasy, they just started to feel more and more transparent and thin to me. So he got those. I got some of the weird crap, because that's what I kind of go for. And I got... Um, what I, There are two chapters on YA, and the one on bitter YA is more mine. And then we had a deal, oh, and, and he got the early part and the early Victorians, and I got the late Victorians, which played to what we kind of knew about. Then he gets the first half of America, I get the first half of Britain. So it was straightforward. And we discussed each chapter and what we wanted in each chapter before we started writing, but we're very different writers. See, Mike and my partner, Edward, are the other side of the computer divide. <laughs> they wrote their theses by hand. They wrote one draft, they edited it, they sent it to the, type, to the typist, or in Mike's case, typed it himself. What that means is that they think quite linearly, and their first drafts and their final drafts look fairly similar. <laughs> I work more like a builder, <laughs> and I'm not even that orderly. <laughs> so. My first drafts and my 13th drafts are radically different species. Mike says he's never actually seen such a wide gap between first and 13th. <laughs> not helped by the fact that I'm not really a writer. I don't particularly enjoy writing. I don't feel a ma massive urge to write. I write because I have something to say. And I was a crap writer at school. Though, if you worry that you'll never get the hang of it, please don't. I didn't get the hang of writing until my final year at university. Yeah, really. Uh, I failed most of my first year, uh, didn't deliver any essays, basically. Uh, I, I loved the research, it was the actual sitting down and writing the thing that was the problem. Um, so we just have totally different approaches. And the irony was it was Mike's approach that was more problematic, because he would have delivered perfect chapters. And the problem with that is that there was no room for intervention. So Edward and I did it differently. Edward and I used to make lists of every of the books we needed for each chapter. And then whoever knew what they were, talk, were talking about would talk, literally talk, not dictate, talk. And the other person would type. And that both combined the tone and stopped it getting too perfect each time. Does that make sense? Yeah. But Mike and I were on opposite sides of the Atlantic. We couldn't do that. So I had to teach him how to become a sloppy, open writer, <laughs> to write more than he would need so we could take stuff out, to write in blocks rather than smoothly so we could move stuff around. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think that was quite good for him. He improved my grammar no end. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that. And then there was the kinds of themes we were, we were talking about. Because the two, the two traditions don't map easily. And then as the colonial tradition started to emerge, they produce different things. So some of these things we found that were really interesting, which had actually come out of my work on kids' science fiction, was the different manifestations of racism in different countries. So, and, and please understand, this is really crude, okay? I've got a much more elaborate version, but this is the crude version. So American racism boils down to, they weren't really here, look away, pretend they aren't there, and by the way, if they all die, it's just natural. Has anybody seen a rival? Yes. Yes. There's a line in that said by a black officer that no black officer would say. He's talking about Australians, and about uh, Aboriginals, and he says, and when a superior race came along, they were wiped out, and I literally did that. <laughs> I'm sorry, there is no way an African American would say that line. I just, oh, just froze. But that notion of genocide being kind of okay because we're superior is embedded even in liberal science fiction. You know, you can see the reaction. Canada, whether truthful or not, and there are all arguments about this, is a much more assimilative neighbourly narrative. Oh, they are our neighbours, we get on just fine. The fact that we've kind of pushed them into a corner is another matter. The fact that we're busy depriving them of their land because we want to mine there is not. But the narrative in all the fantasy is very much about um, working together. So you find a lot of Native American guides in Canadian fantasy. Um, Catherine, I'm going to get her name wrong, Catherine Anthony Clark was writing at the same time as Lewis, and it's well worth looking at for comparison. 
the golden pine cone is, is best known. Lots of native guides, lots of involvement with local people. So there's, there's this narrative. Um, Australians, until the 1970s, it's mostly as if they're indigenous people, simply do not exist. They are just not there. And then it all gets terribly appropriative and spiritual in that kind of pagan way. And the British stuff of all is, of course, is all very much about, oh, well, we're teaching them and they'll be civilised and our equals eventually. We just haven't quite figured out where eventually is going to be. So uh, comparing those kinds of things and the way that manifests in the fantasy, even when you're talking about portal fantasy, because it maps onto portal fantasy and how natives of portal fantasy are dealt with. If you think about what I've just said about the British, that totally describes the, four, the two kings and queens in Narnia. Yes? Yep. Yeah. We will raise the, the, the animals to our level. Um, whereas if you look at Catherine Antony Clark, it's, oh, we're all living happily together. Uh, but there's a very good book called The Secret Land of Og by Pierre Berton from the 1970s, in which the Cana a Canadian child is giving this line to the people who live underground about how, oh, you should come up, come up above, we'll all live happily together. There's um, black and brown, etc., etc. And the little green person says, and how exactly does that work out? <laughs> Literally, that is the line. So there's a, a rethinking. Okay, so that was one. But the other biggie, which ended up obsessing me, was the landscape of fantasy. Now, this really did become my obsession rather than Mike's, and I did hand it over to him as well. I became fascinated by just how interior early British fantasy was. It quite literally takes place in the home. And we see, stage by stage, it moves from the home, where adventures, uh, there's Nina's Nesbitt, one in which they have adventures on a tabletop. There's another one, I've forgotten the author, where they go into a, a China palace, made of China, but it is also Chinese. Okay? They stay within the home. And then, 20 years later, they're going out into the garden. And it's only really when you get to the 1930s, when, of course, the middle classes are they're having nannies. There's a genuine short... <laughs> I hadn't realised until I started working on this book the degree to which our understanding of 1930s children's literature, fantasy and non-fantasy, is distorted by our failure to understand the servant crisis. The reason for all those free-range children is no nannies. <laughs> okay? 20 years before, nannies. But in the 20s and 30s, the middle classes are really very badly off. And, and we do tend to forget that. The women are isolated, there's still no contraception, so they've got five or six kids. They're exhausted, they're often working for pin money, but saying they're not working. And they just let the kids go off. And that's where you get this tradition from. And, uh, if you're interested in this, has anybody read a book called Canadian Mother Help Me? Oh, it's fascinating, it's somebody's thesis, and in some ways it's slightly boring, except it's not. Um, somebody sent a letter to Good Housekeeping in about 1930 saying, I am living in the middle of Wales, I have five kids, I cannot cope, can any mother help me? And it started what we now call an APA. Um, about 15 women got together, I've seen one person nodding, and each month they'd all send a piece of writing to one person, who would stitch them all together, and put them in beautiful embroidered covers. And then they would send them round in order, and they would all write notes on them, and they'd all get to eat the notes. These things still exist, I, I don't just mean the ones I'm talking about, this becomes a long tradition in plenty of places. And they talked about everything. And one of the reasons this particular set of documents is so important is because two of the women went on to found Virago Press. Huh. And several of the women went on to be counselors and reformers and other things. But at this moment in their lives, they were stuck in the middle of nowhere with kids and no nannies, and they hated it. <laughs> it's a, sorry, it's a total deviation. But it's a fascinating and rather, rather bitter book. It's mm. very, very sad. Oh, and because I had a row with my mom over this. They're also at that point where they're poor because the middle classes have to send their kids to boarding school or they stop being middle class. And again, it's easy to forget the costs of that. I was talking to my partner about this yesterday. He's much older than me. And he remembers his grandparents talking about how poor they'd been when their kids were young. Because even though the family wasn't doing well, the children had to go to boarding school. Because if you didn't, you dropped out of your class place. And of course, girls often didn't get to go because if there wasn't enough money. Sorry. But all of that affects the fantasy. So very slowly, it moves farther out and farther out. Whereas American fantasy is almost always about taking control of the land. So is Canadian fantasy. 
less so Australian. Australian is often much more about trying to pretend you're English until it starts to change. Okay, slightly weird things going on there. So there are those kinds of different uses of the land and different ways of embracing folklore as well, which is much more Mike's area, where for the British, folk stories always happen somewhere else. Well, for the English, shall I say. It's primitive people who do folk stories. We don't have any folk stories. We all know this is nonsense, but I assume mm. most of you recognize what I'm talking about. Exotic is somebody else. Canadians and Australians don't do that because they're trying to embed themselves in this land. And one of the interesting things about Canadians is that they recognize you as Canadian from the moment you step off the boat. Now, that's not true of Americans. Americans maintain their immigrant status and at least their first generation. But Canadians, you're a Canadian from the moment you arrive. And there's some lovely stuff from the early period, which is very much about Canadianizing folklore. Wonder books are very popular. Um, uh, James Balfour produces rather, some rather wonderful ones. And they end up kind of weirdly multicultural by default in ways that we would now call appropriative, but it's actually rather gentle and affectionate. Um, so it's hard to describe. It looks very different to the British and quite different to the Australian where local folklore is scary. And remember I mentioned genocide? Americans don't have local folklore. <laughs> I mean, I know there are ex exceptions, but generally, even now, an awful lot of American fantasy imports the folklore. American Gods is a classic example. Um, the War of the Oaks imported folklore. Almost everything by Charles de Lint. It's, it's this conceit that the folk creatures have also migrated. Um, it's fascinating, but you can see the same patterns of racism playing out. And I do want to be clear, whenever I talk about different racisms, I'm not, I'm not trying to excuse anybody, but we do need to recognize that there are different patterns of this, um, and also against different peoples. Uh, so again, a deviation. There's a very good book called Orphan Trains, which looks at the exporting of orphans from the East Coast to the West in America. Now, a lot of these kids weren't actually orphans, they were street kids, and they were basically kidnapped by being offered jobs, right? There's one particular orphan train that took Irish Catholic children across to California, but dropping them off as they went. And for the first half of that trip, they are Catholic children. The white people don't want them because they're Protestants and they end up with Latino families. But in the West, when they try to put the kids with Latino families as a race red, because after a certain point, the kids become white. So race isn't even the same on both sides, okay? And attitudes to Chinese and Japanese are shifting constantly in the 19th and 20th century as well. There are race riots in Vancouver in the 1920s directed almost entirely at the Japanese and uh, Chinese community. Uh, and that influences what's going on as well. Okay, next question. Sorry? Well, that's fine, <laughs> yes, I was quite enjoying that, actually. Um, okay. Oh, you, you can follow stuff up. <laughs> I can't, I can't process it well enough, quickly, annoyingly. Um, what do you want to know about? <laughs> uh, oh, I see. Because um, we can always get the questions from them and then come back to That is true. I, have, I do have one, one question about... You, you picked up on it earlier, and I, it's something that I picked up when I was reading it, about you describing children's fantasy as the innovator in that post, Pussy. the innovator yeah. in the post-war period. Um, do you not feel that that slightly um, keeps fantasy as a closed system, rather than fantasy actually being influenced by a lot of other genres? Um, interesting question. I mean, it very clearly is influenced by the genres, but it is also a remarkably effective closed system because fantasy readers read other fantasy writers. Um, we can trace affinity groups, yeah. which makes it rather fun. And they don't always know each other, but they often have... Uh, John Clute uses the phrase taproot text. Yes. Um, so we have the Tolkienistas who didn't particularly know each other, but Jane Yolan, Diane Jones, Susan Cooper, Alan Garner, all of whom at some point studied with Tolkien. 
Ghana for not for long because he left. Um, but often, and this is something that came up in my book on science fiction, the influences aren't other fiction. No. The influences are folklore, history, science, technology, anthropology. Anthropology has done so much damage to fantasy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, when, and when I was doing the research for the intergalactic playground, we, I did a really an accidental large survey. Okay, it was only supposed to. Basically, I sprained my wrist whilst I was doing research in Canada, and I had to do something when I got to the point I could type again. So I slung a little survey up intending to put it up for one week and get maybe 20 <laughs> responses. And Corey Doctorow, Neil Gaiman and Karen Travis blogged it and I got a thousand. <laughs> but one of the questions I'd asked was, what did you read? And non-fiction, for most fantasy and science fiction readers, was a minimum of 20% of their reading, okay? And it was wide. And it was true of all age groups, religion, I mean, just about everything. And I'd say that a lot of the time that's what we're looking at. Because when you ask writers about their literary influences, it still tends to be quite closed. There may not be genre fantasy writers they cite, but they're always writers on the edge of the fantastic. Um, and in that sense, I do think there are two quite distinct traditions of writing that are trying to do very different things. Um, well, it's both about attitude, about the way you use words, about metaphor, about what metaphor is, what it does, about what, I mean, it, it, it's hard to, sometimes to put your finger on, but one of the things <coughs> I got quite interested in is where is that line between fantasy and metaphor, and those books that you get annoyed with because they're not proper fantasy. <laughs> and this isn't just that they want you to take a lesson from them, but that they're only fantastical in order to give you the metaphor. So I like Jeanette Winterson's work very much, but mm -hmm. I didn't like Sex and the Cherry for that reason. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, that on the whole, the lovers of the fantastic want the fantastic to be real. Yeah. And that, that moment we were all disappointed in Alice, um, in, Alice in Wonderland, where it's a dream. <laughs> No! <laughs> but there, is, there aren't that many people who write both. There are a few, but not that many. No, there there are certainly aren't that many who do both well. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. Mm. I, yeah, that's a question I want to go away and think about. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I'll have an answer by the end. You can definitely go away and think about that one. That's fine. Um, oh, sorry, and the one it? thing I will want to say is that the big influence is romantic balance. Yeah. Uh, romance, uh, all the stuff that was being taught in the late 19th century. The fact that 19th and early 20th century kids had to use inc learn incredibly long poems about knights in armour <laughs> probably did a lot to fuel fantasy. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't write about this so much. My partner um, gives the annual lecture on a world war. Angie Ruskin's English department has a, a module that I sponsor but don't teach on. It's very typical of me. Uh, where I said, it is the First World War, you cannot not do a module on the First World War. <laughs> so for five years only, they are doing a module on the literature of the First World War. And Edward goes over and does a lecture on Tolkien. And uh, Lord of the Rings is a great war novel. Yep. But one of the things he talks about is the huge influence of medievalism on schools, on boys' culture, on girls' culture. If you, we both got fascinated that if you read the Boy Scout and Girl Guide manuals, the between about 1900, uh, 1900 and 1930, and I know they haven't quite started then, they all refer to being a knight, to being valiant, to being <laughs> bold, to being honourable. They use that language. Now, an entire generation absolutely primed to love fantasy. And frankly, the world was going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. So, uh, you are now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, let's be quite honest, next five years I'm going to be reading a lot of fantasy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, all those books I have on my bookshelf seem really appealing. <laughs> I unfortunately am writing about Robert Heinlein, the oh, chap who predicted Donald Trump that thought it would be 2012. <laughs> Prophet Nehemiah Scudder wins an extremely poisonous uh, presidential election in 2012 by telling lies about everybody, and there isn't another election. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's going to be fun. I'll finish this book. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I have a couple more questions, but I am happy to see if any of you guys have We've questions. Got three for now. Anyone <laughs> want to launch in at all? Yeah, um, so far you've sort of explored fantasy as a literary phenomenon, yeah. and you, you excitingly bring in all these things to it. But I wondered what you thought of um, kind of non literary fantasy. Okay. So everything from UFO sightings to John Martin's post apocalyptic paintings of the <laughs> Sadly, we had to decide not to cover stuff. We really did. Um, a different book. As I said, that definition of where we started was part of the problem. I love fantastical art. Um, but we, I sneaked a little bit in. Uh, I forgot his name now, the guy who did those microscopic paintings, the Fairy Fellows Masterpiece. Richard Thank you. And a modern artist, Richard Ennis, I love. So I don't have a problem with it being a multi-platform genre, I think that's cool. But it often does slightly different things. So, I mean, in a sense, what are you asking me when you say what do you think? So if, so if fantasy stops becoming fantasy literature and becomes, and fantasy literature becomes an element of fantasy, which also includes the other arts, which also includes of course it is. UFO oh, sightings. Did you read the book? I'm just checking. I'm no, no. <laughs> so uh, one of the things we start off by talking about in chapter two, I think, is the interaction with the pre Raphaelites. Yeah. Because, of course, the emergence of fantasy literature and fantasy art is not two movements, it's one. And it then begins to bifurcate. And in some ways, fantasy arts had a much harder road to toe than fantasy literature. And I wish I was the right person to do this because nobody else seems to be doing it. There is no good book on fantastic art. Okay, there is just nothing. And I think that's a real shame because in a sense that needs to be written in order for us to actually start looking at that interaction. Because there are, in particular, there are some artists and writers who've had very strong relationships where our understanding of the text is strongly related to the book cover, for example, or the series of book covers. Um, there are some writers where a movie or a television program has given us a strong image. Mm. So there's constant interactions. There are quite a number of writers who paint. One of the exhibits I didn't manage to pull together for Worldcon in 2014 was I really wanted an exhibit of art by well-known writers who paint and draw quite seriously. Chani Mieville, Steph Swainston, Joe Haldeman, uh, that's just off the top of my head, but there are, I had a list of about 20. So there, there is a fairly constant interaction going on, and the visual culture, well, Mervyn Peake's the obvious, the visual culture is a very much part of, of, of what emerges. Um, and can give you odd reactions. I can't go see the How to Train Your Dragon movies because I get the uncanny valley effect from the depiction of the dragons. Do you know what I mean by the uncanny valley effect? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, there's this thing where if something looks very different to us, we're just cool. But if it looks almost like us, but not quite, we get creeped out. And there's something about the flat-faced dragons in those. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm sorry, and I don't get creeped out easily, but I can't watch them. And that in itself is a question, that my reaction to a book is shaped by that. And very often, whether we, I mean, we do judge books by a cover, a cover don't we? Hence, I adore the cover for this. I'll explain later if anybody wants to know. There's a reason for that cover. Um, so when a book is marketed, the cover can decide its genre. So Steph Swainston had terrible trouble with her first book because it was given a classic um, Les Edwards fantasy cover. Only, although it is fantasy, it reads much more like science fiction. It's got engines, it's got political philosophy. And the number of people said, I picked up this book, it looked wonderful, and I hated it because it's really science fiction. Repackaged, did beautifully. So there's that interaction as well. I, when I teach genre, I teach a whole section on book covers and genre identity, and how that's contributed to what we understand. I mean, Alice is an obvious one with a constant repackaging, move away from Tenniel back to Tenniel, all of that. Yeah. I'd love to be able to do more work on that, but you have to make decisions. And many years ago, after I did a couple of articles on TV, I realized that doing close readings of television series was taking me six months. <laughs> I mean, I literally sat and watched the whole third rock from the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 